Hello everyone and welcome to um, our first code along in the advanced forecasting module. So um, the first thing we're going to do is try and simplify the problem a bit. So we have a couple of things we need to deal with. The first is how do we process our data? And the second is how do we use these models to forecast? So those are fairly complex things that we need to learn. And what we don't really want to do is complicate that even further by mucking about with neural networks at this stage. So instead, what we're going to do is look at these two issues independent of neural networks. And the way we're going to do that is just use a bog standard regression model. So we're going to build uh, an ordinary least squares regression model, a linear model, and we're going to use exactly the same pre-processing routines and forecasting routines that we'll look at with feed-forward neural networks. OK, so we'll learn how to do that bit first, and then we'll add a bit more complexity with the neural networks. So we're going to look at the mechanics of fitting time series to an autoregressive model. OK, so and I've provided you some code that you can reuse to do that. And then we're going to look at the two methods that we discussed in the theory lecture, which is the iterative approach to forecasting and then the direct modeling approach to forecasting. So uh, this is a pretty simple notebook um, in terms of dependencies. Um, the one that you need to make sure you've got is stats models because that contains the linear regression class that we're going to use. Um, so this will run fine in Google Colab and uh, it will work with the environment that we've provided um, for this course. You could also pip install stats models. Um, you need to be using at least version 0.11.1. So let's just import those um, values. You can see I'm using stats models 11.1. Um, and then from the stats models regression linear model um, namespace, we're going to import the OLS or ordinary least squares class. So let's talk about, let's just briefly refresh our memory about autoregressive forecasting. So this is a type of forecasting where we, we include lags of the time series in our model. So we predict a Y value, one value, with, for example, the two values that preceded it. So we would call that an autoregressive model of order two or of lag two. So we need to choose how many lags we want to include in our model and we need to decide how far into the future we're going to predict. Are we predicting the next point or are we predict predicting two points beyond that? Once we've made that decision, we will pre-process our data. I'm going to turn it from a single column of data into a table of data. So we'll have a y variable as one of the columns that we're trying to predict, a dependent variable if you prefer, and then we'll have a few columns, say two columns, that we use to represent the lags for that y value. So they'll be our independent variables that we're going to use to predict the y value. So we've changed this into a supervised learning problem. So it's quite different from, for example, the type of data we looked at with profit. Um, we've now got more of a, ta a tabular data set that we would use with a standard supervised learning problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. Once we've got through that hurdle, we can fit our model. OK, so we just take a regression model and we fit it to our tabular data. And then we can use the procedures we're going to learn about to iteratively forecast one step ahead. <clears throat> so. Let's, let's generate some data that we can use with this process. Um, and what we'll do is we'll just use a really simple cosine wave here, just again to simplify the problem. Um, if you don't know what I mean by a cosine wave, um, let me introduce you. Um, so it's a simple oscillating wave between one and minus one. OK, so it's very predictable, which is a good thing, so that will help us just check that our model's working correctly. Um, we've stored that in a variable called TS data, time series data. Let's have a look at the first 10 values of that. Um, so you can see it's just simple numeric data within 
a numpy array. So how do we pre-process our time series? Well, uh, a time series consists of L, L lag, you know, an autoregressive model consists of L lags. Okay, so we need to make a decision about that. Let's say we're gonna go for two. So we wanna turn that into this table I was talking about. So we want a table that contains three columns. Two of the columns contain our lags and our third column contains the variable we're trying to predict, yt. And what we're gonna end up with in Python code is basically two arrays. Okay, so the, the y train array is really simple to understand. It's just a NumPy array and each value within that, each element within that NumPy array is a scalar value. It's a, it's a numeric value of some type. So it might be, for example, the number of people that attended an accident emergency department on that day. Our X train data is our, are our features in our supervised learning problem. So each element in that array will be several values. Okay, so uh, an element might be a NumPy array itself. So that, for example, might contain the lags. So it might contain two lags or three lags or four lags, depending how many you've included. So we need to take our single time series, our single NumPy array, and we need to convert it into these two separate NumPy arrays, which, which represent our table in kind of abstract programming terms. And what, I could, what I'll do is I'll, I'll convert this into a pandas data frame afterwards so you can see it in that tabular view to try and get your head around what I've done. So we normally call this a sliding window approach. Um, and the good news is I've provided you the code um, for you to be able to produce that data yourself. Um, so what we'll do is we will just kind of you know, skim over sliding window to start off with. And what I'll do is I'll show you the data that it produces, and then we'll, we'll come back to it and we'll have a look at this for loop to understand exactly what it's doing. So let's do a train test split. And then what we'll do is we'll pass that data to the sliding window function and have a look at the shape of that data that comes back. So uh, in my training set, I'm gonna keep 175 values. So we're just slicing the NumPy array TS data here up to 175. And then the test data is everything from index 175 to the end of that NumPy array. And then we pass those values to the sliding window function. Um, so that's the first, the first value in that function is the data. And then we specify the window size. And the window size is just um, a technical term for how many lags would you like to include in this model. So in this case, I'm going to include two lags. So we've done that for both the uh, train and test. So we've ended up with four NumPy arrays, X train, Y train, X test, Y test. Let's have a look at the shape of the X train data and the Y train data. So the Y train data is, is pretty simple to understand because we've got uh, 172 rows, each consisting of one value. And then the X train data, we've got uh, the matching 172 rows, each containing two features, which are the two lags we want to include. Um, let's have a closer look at that. So if we print out, for example, let's go back to TS data and print out the first three values. Um, and then we'll print out the first value in X train and the first value in Y train. So here's our first three values in our time series, one, 0 0.98 and 0 0.92. If we look at the first element of X train, that contains one, and 0 0.98, so the first two elements of our array. And in our Y train, element zero, we have a single value, which is 0 0.92, which is the final value in our X train. So we've, we've chopped up this time series into two variables, one of the size of the lags and one containing the value we're trying to predict. Let's move our window along 
Okay, and now we're going to look at the next three values in the sequence by just move sliding the window along by one. So we've started from element one and we're slicing to element four. So that'll give us three values. And that's equivalent to looking at the next value in X train and the next value in Y train. So here we are. So here's our next three values. So we've just moved along from one to here. We just slid our window along. So we've got 0 0.98, 0 0.92 and 0 0.82. So in the first element of X train, we've got 0 0.98 and 0 0.92, which is the first two values in our window. And then we're trying to predict the third value in our window, which is 0 0.82. And we just repeat that all the way along to the end of the time series. So where, what do you get at the end? Well, this bit of code here just converts um, X train and Y train into a table. So this is what we've, and we're just looking at the head of that, the first five values. So this is what we've ended up with. This is the three columns of data. So we've got our YT, which is the value we're going to predict. That's our dependent variable. And then we've got our features. We've got lag one and lag two. So this is the previous value in the series and that's the previous variable minus two. And we've done that all the way to the end of the data set. So that's our table of data. That's what we want to fit our regression model to. So that's what we do in sliding window. Okay, so we've seen that it takes two values, one of which is the data set, the training data set, if you want, that you want to slide along. Um, and then we've got our window size. So how many lags would we like to include? Um, horizon is something we're going to look at with the direct forecasting method. We'll come back to that. But for the moment, it's fine to just leave it as default value of one. So the function itself is very simple. Um, we create two lists here, tabular X and tabular Y. Um, so this contains our X features and this contains our Y dependent variable. And then we've got a for loop and all we're going to do is loop through um, and each time the X train that we select is a slice of the training data from the current value up to the window size plus I. And then the Y train is a single value. So you, you know it's a slice because you've got the colon in the middle and here we don't have a colon. So we know that we're selecting a single value from the Y train data. Okay, and I'll let you work out the I plus window size plus horizon minus one, why, you, why I do that. So once you've selected that data, you append it to the lists that we've created. Okay, so we're, we're storing the current X train data in the tabular X. So that's a row. Okay, so each, each iteration of this creates a row in our table. And then at the end, I'm just returning those um, as NumPy arrays. Okay, so I've said as array there, but it could have just easily have been np.array. Um, so that works fine for, for the X data. Uh, for the Y data, we, we want that in a very specific shape. So we just need to use a bit of NumPy magic there to make sure it comes back um, in the format of rows comma one. Okay, so that's what that minus one one is there. That's standard NumPy stuff to reshape an array. So we've got our data, okay? And that's exactly the same as we would do with a feed forward neural network. Once we've got that, what we can do is fit it to a model. So that might be a neural network uh, in this case, we're just going to fit it to an ordinary least squares regression. OK, so we saw that we imported the OLS class. Um, I'm not going to go through the theory of ordinary least squares regression here, just to remind you that regression produces a linear model. Um, and that linear model is normally very useful in lots of problems. And we have a dependent variable and we have a set of independent variables. So in stats models, uh, if you want to know more about this, I recommend seeing, um, looking up uh, the stats models documentation, which is excellent. 
um, I'm just going to summarize how you create and fit a model here. Um, so the first thing we need to do is make sure that our model has an intercept term, so a, a value on the y-axis where the model will start from. And we do that by in stats models by calling sm.addConstant. So we pass in the training data and output pops a new version of that with an additional column, all of which is set to the value one. Uh, and then we pass our training data uh, for the Y and our training data for X to the OS class. So we set the endogenous variable to be Y train and the exogenous variables to be X train. So endogenous train variables and exogenous variables are an econometric way of talking about ordinary least squares regression. So another way to call it is the dependent variables and independent variables. So once we've created our, our, our instance of OLS, um, we fit the model and that returns um, a, an instance of a class called regression results. So that's something, so this model that we return is what we use for prediction. So let's have a look at the summary of that model. Um, so this is a nice summary of that regression model. So a quick thing to, to look at to assess model fit is the R-squared and adjusted R-squared, uh, and that varies between zero and one. We can see here it's a perfect fit because this is a very predictable time series. Okay, so our adjusted R-square is one. Okay, so perfectly predictable. Then when we go down here, we've got our constant term, our intercept. Um, we've got our, um, I think, lag two and lag one. Okay, we can see here that the, the model puts a lot of weight on the previous lag, which is to be expected. Um, so that's a positive weight and a negative weight on um, lag two, although that is still useful in the prediction. Okay, so next up, we will take a look at um, forecasting one step ahead. Okay, welcome back. Um, so let's have a look at forecasting one step ahead. So we've ended up with a regression results object from our call to fit. Um, now, this implements a number of uh, handy methods, one of which is called, hey, it's called predict. Who would have guessed? Um, so for that, we just pass in our exogenous variables you know, a list of um, X variables that we want to predict, and that will predict a Y value for us. So let's see how we do that. Um, so we're gonna work with the X test data, uh, and I'm going to pass in um, that to the add constant function first. So that's just gonna add that additional column that we need for working with stats models. So that will be an additional column where all values are set to one. And then we pass that to, we're going to pass the first element from X test to um, the predict, that's our exogenous variable, and that returns a prediction for us. Now the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that um, I have a um, uh, uh, some array notation on the end here. That's just because predict returns a numpy array. Um, in this case, it only contains one value. So I'm just going to show you the scalar value from that. Okay, and then we're going to print that out, and we're also going to print out the ground truth value from our Y test values. Okay, so here's our one step forecast, which was minus uh, 6656, and our ground truth value was minus uh, 6656, so it's identical, okay, which we would expect with a regression model with R squared of 1. Um, so if you're using the OLS object, it's worth noting that more modern versions of um, stats models also implement the get prediction method. So again, all we do is we pass in um, our exogenous variable um, and we get something called a prediction results object in return. We get a, yet another object that we can work with. Um, but I, I kind of love this object because it, it has this summary frame method. Okay, and the summary frame method is a, is a nice simple way to get a prediction interval with our point forecast. Um, so we just pass in our um, exogenous variable, so x test element zero, 
um, and that returns a, a prediction results object that we've called results. And then I'm just going to call the summary frame method. And I'm going to get uh, an 80% prediction interval here. So this is the um, one minus alpha prediction interval. So we get a nice data frame. So we get the point forecast, which was this value here, we'd already seen. We get a standard error for that. Uh, and then we get a confidence interval, um, which is a confidence interval for the mean. And then we get an observation confidence interval, an ob observational confidence interval upper, which is our prediction interval. In this case, it's not much use because we've got a perfect model. But in the real world, where you won't have a perfect model, um, these prediction intervals are extremely useful. Welcome back. Okay, so let's talk about the iterative method for forecasting with a regression model. So in the previous um, example, we saw how to predict one step ahead. And we did that using the previous two observations in the time series. So how do we predict the next step ahead? Because we don't have the ground truth observations at that point because we're forecasting two steps ahead. So the answer is instead of using ground truth observations for our forecast, we're gonna use one ground truth observation and our forecast for our one step ahead prediction. So let's have a look how that works. Um, so let's take, for example, a situation where we've predicted one step ahead and our forecast is 999. We're building a model uh, based on four lags. Okay, and our four lags are one, two, three, four. And we now want to create data that we put into our forecasting model to predict this second step ahead, another step ahead. So the way I've always done that is to use uh, np.roll. So let me show you how that works. So if we've got our current um, x variables, which is one, two, three, four, I'm gonna call np.roll and I'm gonna shift everything by minus one. And that's gonna work in a circle. So one is gonna to move to the end of the array here and four is gonna move down one, three is gonna move down one. So we end up with this two, three, four, and one. We now want to drop this off the end because we want to replace that with uh, what we think is the latest value in our sequence, which is our forecast of 999. So I'm now going to add another line of code, which uses array slicing to add on our Y prediction onto the end of that X vector. So this is the data we now put into our forecast and it will then predict the next value in the sequence. So we can do that uh, with a function, surprise, surprise. So I've created one called autoregressive iterative forecast where you pass in your model, which will be your OLS model, your exogenous variables, which will be your X array um, and the number of steps ahead you want to forecast and it's gonna return a NumPy array of your predictions. So it just copies that code that we had up here and puts it into a loop. So we're continually going to loop through, create a Y prediction by calling model.predict, where we pass in our current X values and we save that prediction in an array. Then we roll our array and we add our new Y prediction onto the head of that array. And then at the end, we return all of our Y predictions. So if we forecast far enough ahead, we're only going to be using forecast variables. So we're going to be forecasting off forecasts. And that is essentially how um, an iterative forecast works. Um, so let's try that. So let's try um, forecasting uh, five time periods into the future. We're gonna use our model. So let's just remind ourselves what our model was. Scroll up. Um, so this was our model. 
and we fitted it on two lags. Okay, so if we're forecasting five into the future, we're going to end up predicting off predictions. Where are we? Here we go. So we just call our auto regressive iterative forecast method, pass in our OLS model, pass in our first um, test data array and H, which is set to five, which is our forecast horizon. So this is what we end up with. So our iterative forecast gives us these values. So in summary, that's uh, 0 0.66 minus 0 0.66 minus 0 0.5 minus 0 0.32. And we can compare that to our ground truth values, which are minus 0 0.665 minus 0 0.5 minus 0 0.32. Just to highlight that there for you. Um, so you can see that um, they're pretty much identical. Uh, in fact, when yes, they're completely identical um, because we're forecasting this simple cosine wave. And each time we produce a forecast, it's pretty much identical to the ground truth value. So when we feed that back in, um, it's like feeding a ground truth value back in. So let's, let's see what happens when our time series isn't so well behaved. Let's add in some noise. So again, we're going to create a cosine wave of, of size 200, but now we're going to create some, some noise, some, some jitter to add into that, which will be normally distributed with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of 0 0.3. And now if we plot that, don't worry if you don't fully understand that, if we plot that, that just means we've got a noisy cosine wave. Okay, so it's not smooth. Um, there's, some, there's some randomness added to that data. Okay, so this uh, select model via AIC function um, is just to help me to decide how many um, lags I should include in my model. Um, so it's gonna try um, a range of uh, window sizes. Um, so I'm going to try um, up to, to from two to 20 in, in stepping up in two each time. Uh, and I'm just going to select the one that fits my data the best. And I'm going to use something called um, AIC to do that selection, a cakey information criterion. Um, and that just means that it's going to try and pick the simplest model that's the best fit to the data. So if we run that, um, it's decided that we need to include a model with 18 lags, so quite a lot of data included. Um, so if we plot that, uh, what we've done is we've fitted an ordinary least squares regression of, with uh, an autoregressive terms of order 18, so 18 lags are included in the model. Um, and when we plot that, the blue line represents our actual data, our noisy, our noisy cosine wave, and our fitted model, our regression model, is the orange data. So we can see it's a pretty good fit to the data that it's seen. So now what we want to do is set up our test data and pass in um, the test data to our model to see how well it does at forecasting data it hasn't seen. So how well can it forecast uh, this remaining blue data into the future. Okay, so we're going to select our best window size, which is of size 18. And we're going to call our sliding window method to get our training data and our test data. Then we're going to build our model, uh, our regression model. Uh, and then we're going to pass that regression model to our auto regressive iterative forecast method to produce our iterative predictions. And we're gonna go the full length of the test data into the future. And then we'll plot that at the end. So we've just plotted the test data. So what can we see? Well, the blue line is our iterative forecast. And then our orange line is our ground truth value this time. Um, so you can see that that's, that's a reasonable fit. It's still been able to pick up the pattern in the data, even though there's some noise added to it, which is good. Um, so next up, we will take a look at the direct forecasting method. 
Uh, so welcome back and now we're going to talk about the direct forecasting method. So this is different from the iterative approach because in this method um, for forecasting multiple periods ahead we're going to create multiple models. Uh, so in this example the, it's telling me here the length of the Y test data is 31 periods. So to use the direct forecasting method that means we need to build 31 models. So the first of those models will be a one-step forecaster. It will be trained on values that predict one step ahead. The second of those models will be a two-step forecaster. So it will predict not the first time period ahead, but the second. So it will only predict a single value, but that will be the second in the sequence ahead. And the third will predict the third value ahead, and so on. So let's think back to our sliding window uh, function. Um, so that contained a third parameter which we ignored at that point, which is the horizon. Okay, and by default that's set to one. So by default, the sliding window function will produce a one-step forecaster for you. Now what we're going to do is use that to predict different horizons into the future. So for example, if we wanted to build a model that predicted two steps ahead, we would set horizon to two. OK, so I'm going to pass in my training data, which remember is the raw format of the time series. I'm going to build a lag two model. So I want my window size to be of size two. And I'm going to forecast two time steps into the future. And that's going to return uh, a vector of X training data and a vector of Y training data. Let's take a look at those. OK, so this first output is our raw time series data. Okay, and that's going to, and that's shown us the first five values in that sequence. Our second output is our X vector of training data. So we can see that's a two lag model. So it shows the first two values in the sequence. And then our Y train, um, our third value output is our, is our Y train, our scalar value that we're trying to predict. Um, and that is 0 0.31. So let's have a look at our raw data. So one, two, three, four. Okay, so that's the fourth value in our sequence. So we're training on these two values and then we're predicting this value. So we're constructing a table of data that consists of three columns. The first two columns are lags one and two and then we're predicting um, two time points into the future. That's our third column. So let's try that now um, with the same training data, the same window size, but predicting uh, three points into the future. So if this is our training data, then three points into the future is 0 0.92. So let's just check that's worked. So here's our training data, our first two points in the sequence, that's correct, and then our Y target variable is 0 0.92, which is the final point in our, in our five sequence. So that, that works as well. So this would be the data that we would train our third regression model on. Um, so we need an approach to train these models. Um, so the simplest way to do this is just in a loop. Um, so that's the code that follows next. Um, so we've created um, a Python list called models. And that's going to contain each of the 31 models we're going to train. We're going to save it in there. We've created um, a variable called horizon and assign the value of 31 to that so that we know we're going to loop 31 times. And then here's our for loop. So 4h in range horizon, so up to the value 31. Create my sliding window of training data. So pass in my raw training data, pass in my window size, which we know our best, well, we think our best is 18. Um, and then we're going to call, um, uh, we're going to pass in the horizon. So this will start from zero. So we're just going to pass in plus one there to make sure we're not doing anything um, silly with our prediction. Then we create our model. So in stats models, remember, we need to add this constant to our training data. And then we call it, we're calling our model, model H. 
So we call our OLS class, pass in our Y train, pass in our X train, and then call fit, and then append that, that results to our models list. Okay, so as quick as that, we've got 31 models that we can use to predict into the future. So to predict with these models, you again would use a loop. Uh, so we've created a um, another function, this time it's called direct forecast. That takes the Python list of models and it takes our initial training data, te sorry, test data that we're going to use to predict. So it's just a really simple loop where we're looping through the models that we've created. And then on each of those models in that array, we call predict. And then we save the scalar result in uh, a, va a value called predh, and then we store that in a Python list called preds. So we loop through all of those and create our 31 predictions from our 31 models, and then we return that. And I'm just casting that to a NumPy array there um, because that's what I want to get out of the, the function. So let's try that. Okay, so just for clarity, uh, I'm recreating our sliding window of, of test data here. Um, so we've got X test and Y test. Uh, and then I'm just adding the constant value to my X test data. Uh, and then I'm passing the first vector from my X test data, that's all I need, into my direct forecasting function. And that forecasting function is going to loop through all of the models I've created and build my predictions and return it in a NumPy array. So let's plot those and see what it looks like. So our direct forecasting method is shown in blue and our ground truth value is shown in orange. So again, you can see that it follows the pattern we would expect it to if it was working correctly. Um, so we, we have that um, uh, kind of like seasonal pattern you get in a cosine wave. And um, so they both looked uh, good matches to the data. Um, let's measure their performance We're using root mean squared error. Uh, what we'll first do is we'll, we'll plot all of them just to, to have a look. Um, so we can see uh, the blue is the direct forecasting method. Um, the orange is the iterative forecasting method. And then the ground truth is now shown in green. So it's actually quite difficult from just this simple chart to determine which is the best forecasting method. Um, you can see at the start, um, they're performing quite in a quite similar way. Um, and then when we're getting to sort of 10 predictions ahead, 15 predictions ahead, they start to diverge a little bit, but they're, they're surprisingly similar. So let's have a go at calculating the root mean square error, squared error. So from stats models, um, import root mean squared error, and then let's plot them. Uh, so output the results. So this is now for y pred, preds iter. So this is the uh, iterative uh, forecasting root mean square error. Um, and then this is the direct method. Oops. Uh, so the direct method has outperformed the, um, uh, the iterative method in this particular example. Um, so that doesn't mean uh, that that will always be the case. Um, you, you might find an iterative approach works better on the particular data set that you are working with.